Good morning and welcome to today's web seminar, Hanging On By A Thread. Um, it's right at 10 o'clock and we're going to give people a few more minutes to join. Uh, thank you everyone for being on today's web seminar. Thank you everyone for uh, joining today's web seminar. It's right at 10.01. Um, there's a high level of interest in the web seminar. We wanna give people just a minute or two more to join, or probably just a minute, uh, and then we'll get started. So thanks so much for your patience. Okay, let's get started. Um, again, thank you everyone for attending today's web seminar, Hanging On By A Thread, The Cumulative Impact of the Pandemic on Youth Who Have Been In Foster Care or Homeless. My name is Amy Lemley, and I'm the Executive Director of John Burton Advocates for Youth. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Debbie Rauscher, Director of Education, Simone Turek Lee, Director of Housing and Health, and intern Ryan Kwong. We're very happy today to share with you the findings of a statewide survey of foster youth that JBay conducted in March, 2021. Our goal in conducting this survey was very simple, to understand how the pandemic has impacted foster youth. Now we know that foster youth started the pandemic facing a steep uphill climb in their transition to adulthood. And the survey findings clearly show that over the last 12 months, the climb has gotten steeper as they have struggled to maintain access to housing, food, employment, and education. We conducted this survey with the hope that the findings can guide policymakers at the state and federal level and inform the actions of county child welfare agencies and philanthropy. Now, I don't need to tell anyone that this last year has been a very challenging one for us all. But as you will learn from the findings of the survey, it has been particularly challenging for foster youth. They've suffered significant negative impacts, which left unaddressed, unaddressed have the potential to shape their lives for decades to come. And with strong, sustained policy interventions, we can ensure that foster youth get back on track and continue their path to a healthy, successful young adulthood. Uh, now, before we start, I'd like to thank the Field Center for Ch Children Policy, Child Policy and pra Practice and Research, excuse me, at the University of Pennsylvania, which generously allowed uh, Jay Bay to use the questions included in its September 2020 report. Now, when possible, we compared the responses from the current survey to the youth responses from that report, which surveyed young, pe surveyed young people in April 2020 to understand how the impact of a particular area such as housing, education, or mental health has changed over time. I'd also like to generous, thank the generous funders who support John Burton Advocates for Youth that make our work possible. Um, so, and to thank the many, many programs who assisted us in the outreach uh, in conducting today's survey. With that, let's jump right in and get to the findings. Uh, so next slide, please. And the next slide, thank you. Oh, next slide. Uh, one thing I wanna say before we start is we took a different approach to our report. We often do a long, highly narrative report followed by a condensed PowerPoint. Uh, we saw a very interesting report in the education sector that was done, which merged these two approaches. So it's a more narrative, uh, graphically oriented report. And so we're, we're piloting that, we're giving it a try. Um, and so you'll see a lot of words on some of the slides we hope that you'll take the time to read the full report. Uh, our focus today will be moving through this uh, new approach to a report presentation, focusing on the key findings. 
So if you don't have time to read all the slides, that's really not the intention of today's presentation. It's really to move you through the report, highlight key findings, and then invite you to revisit the full report. But with that, let's really uh, turn to the methodology. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here's what we did. We interviewed young people who are currently or formerly in foster care age 18 to 24. We used this age frame because it was the same age frame that was used by the field center. Uh, we developed an online survey that was sent across California. Um, as you can see, we had 903 young people complete it. However, 598 were eligible and fully completed the survey. So the number of young people for the responses is really 598. 95 were eligible, but they didn't fully complete it. Uh, and 210 completed it, but they actually weren't eligible. Uh, the, the data collection period was March 9th to uh, March 28th, 2021. And again, we disseminated it through um, THP NMD providers, THP Plus providers, campus support programs. We also sent it directly out to the roughly 1,000 recipients of the Burton Book Fund, which receive uh, assistance in um, uh, higher education for their textbooks. The pros of this, it had a very wide reach, which we we're delighted about. The cons of it, we cannot state that this is representative of all youth in this age category. You know, the gold standard, uh, as always, is the Cal Youth Study. That is a truly representative sample of foster youth. This is much more of a snapshot um, of young people who responded to this survey. And as we move through the findings, um, you know, we'll highlight areas where the findings uh, may not be as representative uh, as um, certainly as the Cal Youth or as if we had a representative sample that was randomly drawn. Next slide, please. So who were these 598 young people? And you can see who they were um, by this slide. Um, the, uh, starting on the left, you can see the age distribution, um, followed by their foster care status at the time of the survey, and then below that, the number of years they were in foster care. Uh, so the greatest number being in that one to five range and then going down proportionally to the uh, 16 to 21 years, the average a uh, little over six years in care. In the center column, you can see what their parenting status is. Um, 20% of the young people were parenting, 80% were not. Again, this is partially a reflection of our strong relationships with THP Plus and THP NMD providers, which uh, kind of disproportionately serve parenting youth. So, you know, this is higher uh, than we'd probably see if it were a representative sample, but this is uh, who these 598 young people are. Next, we'll look at their homelessness status. 6% were currently homeless or couch surfing at the time of the survey. Uh, a whopping 66% uh, had experienced homelessness at some point in their lives. Um, and then a little over one in four had never been homeless. Below that, you'll see uh, current education status. As you can see, a combined 85% of individuals surveyed were attending school either full or part-time. Now, this is one of those respects where this group of young people is different than the general population. The youth surveyed, uh, according to the Cal Youth Study, at age 21, uh, about 28.9% of foster youth are enrolled in school. So, you know, we're not going to shy away from this. We'll be very clear about it. The young people that we are surveying are more connected to school. I want to highlight, though, because as you'll see from the survey findings, these young people who are connected to school and connected to uh, transitional housing programs are struggling. And so if you want to think about these findings, think about them as the best case scenario, because frankly, the young people who are not connected to programs like these, who were willing to do outreach to have young people complete the survey, are certainly likely not doing any better. So I just want to highlight that, um, explain that, and, um, and have everyone think about the findings in that context. On the right-hand column, you'll see the racial and ethnic breakdown of the survey respondents. And, and the last table is the regions of the state where the respondents are from. So now let's jump right in. Um, our findings are divided. We have five major findings. I'm going to talk about the first major finding that relates to housing. Next slide, please. So the major 
finding under housing is the pandemic has destabilized housing. Uh, youth housing, and it has worsened over time. So you have a quote in the right-hand column, and you'll see throughout the report, we've done our best to bring the voices of young people directly uh, to the report. Uh, Ryan, who you'll hear from later, uh, conducted interviews along with one of our youth advocates, Alexis Berries, and um, really tried to bring forth that experience. There were also ample opportunities in the survey for young people to write narrative responses, uh, which they really did. They really shared their thoughts and feelings. Um, and uh, we did our best to bring those thoughts and feelings into the conversation so that you could get a sense of what they're experiencing. Next slide, please. In the survey, we wanted to know the experience of homelessness since the pandemic started. And for me, this is one of the key findings of the entire survey. Uh, the young people reported uh, one in more than one in five, 22% reported having experience of homelessness since the start of the pandemic. That is roughly in one year, 12 months, one in five reported an episode of homelessness. Now, again, if you'll take my caveat from who completed the survey, these are young people connected to school and connected to housing programs, and yet over one in five reported that episode of homelessness. That made us curious, and we wanted to look more deeply into what the experience of these young people was. And so we really looked at young people who had, who had had that experience of homelessness and compared them with those who did not. And so what you'll see here is of those who had had an episode of homelessness, more of them dropped out of school, 17% versus 10%, and more of them were unemployed, 43 versus 30%. Now, all of the comparison statistics that you'll see in the report are statistically significant differences. We did not include any uh, comparisons in the report that were not statistically significant. So the differences you're seeing here aren't artifacts of the data. Um, these are true differences in the experiences of, of young people. And really, this shouldn't be surprising to us. The experience of homelessness is traumatic, difficult, and destabilizing. So it's completely natural that, they would have, uh, that this would have had a spillover effect and impacted uh, their school enrollment and their employment. Next slide, please. We also looked, um, now this is, we went and used the same questions that were in the field center survey, and we asked them to identify specific impacts of COVID-19 on their housing. Now you can see from the table on the left, 29% um, reported fearing being forced to leave their current living situation, followed by 12 saying they have been, 14% say they're currently experiencing homelessness or housing instability, and then 13% uh, reported another negative impact. One in three reported no impact. So that's good news there. Uh, the bad news is two out of three have reported a negative impact. Now we look back at the field center study and we see that one year ago, um, when they were surveyed in April, 2020, 39%. Now again, we know this is a different survey. They're different young people. You know, uh, a statistician would have a field day with the problems with this. Um, but we are using it as a thumbnail, as, as a proxy um, in terms of the experience of young people. We know there's a big difference between 39% and 68%. And this certainly suggests um, that the intensity of the pandemic on, on the housing experiences of young people is intensifying. Next slide, please. We asked young people if they agreed that uh, COVID-19 has had a major impact on housing. Again, this was a question that was asked in the field study, in the field center study, a combined 57% agreed or strongly agreed, and that was up from 37%. Next slide, please. We also took uh, time to identify young people who had turned 21 and elected to remain in foster care. These young people who are facing the housing cliff 
when uh, foster care, when that provision ends, uh, we were very curious to learn about them. Uh, there were 50 young people of the 598 who turned 21 while in care and remained in foster care. On the left-hand side, you can see where these young people live. Um, again, this is another example of where the young people surveyed in this survey are not represented to the, to, uh, to the general group. You can see how more of them are living in THP and MD. Um, in reality, those proportions would be reversed. Um, but again, of the 50 who participated in the survey, that is where they're living. We wanted to understand if remaining in foster care had potentially any kind of protective effect. It seems as though it certainly would. Um, we were delighted to, to kind of look at that and really see that of young people who reported currently being couch surfing, those who are in care, it is 2%. Those who are not in care is 9%. Now, of course, we'd like those who are in care for it to be 0%, um, but we were at least encouraged to see um, that foster care is, you know, partially doing its job. It is giving young people, um, you know, housing. Um, so uh, there's that comparison. Next slide, please. Before I turn it over to Debbie, I want to just speak briefly on food security. Uh, this appears to be one area of all of them where the need was not as glaring. I'm not saying it wasn't serious, but compared to other areas um, such as housing and education, um, you can see on the slide here, young people reported their access to food. Um, the vast majority, 81%, had, had access, but a kind of troubling minority, 18%, were truly in food crisis. We tried to look um, across all the different kind of categories of young people, and the area where the difference was statistically significant was parents versus non-parents. About one in four young people um, who are parents are in food kind of what we would call crisis. They, were, they stated their access to food is very limited um, as compared to non-parents, which was 17%. Uh, so with that, I wanna turn it over to Debbie to discuss the findings in the area of education. Great, thanks so much, Amy. So uh, I'm gonna talk about the findings related to education. Uh, you know, in, in short, um, we have found that there have been very serious impacts from the pandemic on the degree to which youth are connected, continue to be connected to school. Um, what we have found is that many youth have lost their connection with school during the pandemic and suffered negative educational impacts. And I'm gonna kind of go into a little bit more detail about exactly what the survey found. If we can go to the next slide. So the, the impact on uh, educational uh, outcomes for, for the youth in the survey was unequivocal. 100% uh, of youth who were enrolled in school reported that they had at least one negative impact on their education. So this is beyond troubling. Um, you know, the impact on education is just, it couldn't be more clear. When we delved a little bit deeper into understanding exactly what uh, the students were experiencing, the issues that really sort of rose to the top were challenges with distance learning and communication with both instructors and services. So we found that, uh, you know, over half of the youth surveyed reported reduced communication with student services and, and similarly reduced communication with instructors. So the transition to online learning has created some real challenges around students' ability to have the kind of communication that they need to be able to be successful in their classes and access the support that's necessary for them to be successful. I also will just note that in terms of the online learning piece, um, what the survey respondents reported is that it's not just about technology access, Wi-Fi access, but in fact, a lot of frustration was reported with online learning as a modality. And you can see the quote on the slide there, it was fairly typical. I can't do online school, I just don't function that way, it just doesn't work for me. And this is something that was definitely a theme among a lot of the survey respondents, that trying to do online learning for many of them just isn't 
uh, conducive to their ability to learn. So as long as we continue to have remote school, I think that there are going to continue to be these kinds of challenges. Next slide. So we also did have a, a subset of the survey group, one in seven, who was attending high school at the start of the pandemic. So we were able to get a little bit more information about what's transpired with those young people. And you know, this is a group that really has a, a high level of instability more generally. Uh, you know, I mean, we know that this is a time of such key transition and these are these are youth, you know, these are these are young people um, who haven't really even begun to venture into adulthood yet, trying to finish high school, transition to whatever comes next in their life in the middle of a pandemic. Um, they're young, they're vulnerable, they're in a difficult life transitional period. That's all true even when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. And then, of course, now the pandemic is layered on top of that. And so we're seeing that, uh, you know, the pandemic has really had some major implications. The quote there, due to COVID, I had to start my senior year of high school over again. So you know, that we're seeing some academic delays uh, resulting from the pandemic that are gonna potentially influence these young people for a long time. Now, the good news is that most of the youth who were surveyed have managed to remain connected in some form, either by enrolling in college or staying connected to uh, high school, but there is a, a, a percentage that uh, is no longer connected to school in any way as a result of the pandemic. Next slide. So we asked people about, or, or sorry, this is actually um, data that we have collected independently uh, through the web grant system, working with foster youth services coordinating programs to be able to track rates of FAFSA completion among foster youth. So this is not based on self-reported information. This is actually based on verified information around FAFSA completion rates. And JB has sponsored the California Foster Youth FAFSA Challenge for the last four years to try to increase the rates of FAFSA completion so that more foster youth have access to financial aid and can be successful in college. And you can see that over the first three years of the challenge, the rates were going up. Uh, it was a very successful effort. We're seeing more and more students having access to financial aid as a result. And unfortunately, this past year, we saw a, a major setback, a, a major decline in rates of FAFSA completion. This mirrors what we're seeing more generally uh, across the country, as well as in California, with rates of FAFSA completion going down and with disadvantaged students being the most likely, the ones who need the financial aid the most are the least likely to be completing a FAFSA. And this is certainly true for foster youth. And this really poses concerns that go beyond just FAFSA completion rates. You know, it poses concerns for whether we're gonna see students enrolling in college next year, whether those students who do enroll are gonna be able to be successful if they're not accessing financial aid. And so this is something that we're really gonna to have to keep an eye on uh, well into the future. And it really points to the challenges of trying to do this work through remote methods, you know, without being able to have staff go to school sites and sit down with foster youth and complete the FAFSA. It's just made it a lot more challenging to uh, get this done. In addition, what we're hearing from students is that many of them are not seeing college as a viable option right now because of the online learning and the financial challenges they're experiencing. So we really have to do a lot of work in the months ahead to try to reverse some of that. Next slide. We also asked young people about uh, basic need centers. So basic need centers, this is something that's really been growing and expanding across college systems over the last couple of years. And these are centers that have been created at community colleges, CSUs, UCs, to address basic needs such as food, housing, clothing, transportation, to make sure that students not only have the support they need to succeed academically, but also that they have the support that they need to be able to remain enrolled. Because if they're trying to address, trying to figure out when they're going to get their next meal or uh, where they're going to be sleeping that night, it's going to be much harder for them to stay enrolled. We found that 57% of the youth who were attending college that participated in the survey uh, did access a basic needs center. 
and 87% of them indicated that they found those services helpful. So this really speaks to the value of these basic needs centers and how important that they've been as a safety net and a lifeline for some of the most vulnerable students to be able to stay connected to college. Next slide. We also did some additional analysis looking at those students who did report utilizing a basic needs center to see if we could uh, kind of suss out whether there was correlation between accessing a basic needs center and some of the other indicators. And again, you know, just as further evidence of the value of these basic needs centers, we did find that there was in fact evidence that these basic needs centers have made a difference. So we looked at, uh, of those students who utilized the basic needs center and those who did not, was there a difference in whether those same students reported experiencing homelessness? And there was a difference. And even though the difference is small, as Amy noted, uh, it was statistically significant. And so we did see, you know, that small difference between whether the student experienced homelessness. Uh, even uh, the, a more significant or, or greater um, uh, impact of whether these students manage to remain enrolled. And so, of course, this is one of the key purposes of the basic needs centers is to provide students with the resources that they need so that they can stay enrolled in school. And we did see a 10% difference of those uh, who reported accessing a basic needs center, 95% stayed enrolled in school. Those who did not access a basic needs center, only 85%. Uh, remain enrolled. I will note that not every campus has a basic needs center, so this really points to the value of ensuring that every campus can make this kind of resource available. Uh, with the next slide, I'm going to transition a little bit over to um, away from education and to income and unemployment. And so, not surprisingly, um, we've seen a pretty significant impact on um, employment rates and this has resulted in mounting debt. So if we can go to the next slide. So looking at uh, impact on employment, we asked uh, survey respondents if they had been employed before the pandemic and if so what kind of employment and then if they are were currently employed uh, at the point that they were completing the survey. And we do see a drop, a 10% drop from 59% to 49% who, um, who reported being employed. And you know that really uh, was across the board, whether they were employed full-time, part-time, uh, or through gig work. And uh, you, know, you can see from the quote there that just the, the, the snowball effect of the different elements of how this pandemic has influenced you. So I lost my job. I stopped going to school because I didn't have a babysitter. I couldn't do online school because I didn't have Wi-Fi. You know, so it's just sort of one thing after another, uh, making it challenging for these youth to move forward. Next slide. So diving a little bit deeper into the employment data, uh, what we found is that 68% of the youth who responded to the survey had some sort of negative impact to their employment, whether it was completely being laid off, having their hours cut, uh, or no longer having reliable gig work. So the ways in which youth uh, were impacted varied, but 68% of them had some sort of negative impact, and 50% of them had the impact was, was severe, either they were laid off entirely uh, or they um, had their hours or income severely cut because of COVID-19. So that's huge. You know, half of these young people had a major impact on their employment. And we know that for a lot of foster youth, they don't have the same safety net that maybe other young people might have. And so a layoff or a cut to income, you know, half of them having experienced that, um, the repercussions can just be dramatic because there's not necessarily a family system to fall back on in that kind of circumstance. If we go to the next slide, um, we'll see, you know, related and not surprising that overall youth felt strongly that the pandemic had a major impact on their financial stability. So combined 71% of youth either agreed, or strongly agreed or somewhat agreed that the pandemic had a major impact on their financial stability. So again, 
you know, that is just a, a, an enormous number. Um, and we can just see how significant the impact has been on the financial stability of these young people. This is going to have repercussions across education, housing, general well-being, uh, you know, not having adequate financial resources just reverberates across all facets of a young person's life. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. And so we also asked them about whether they were able to access direct cash assistance. And I'll just note um, from the previous slide, we don't have to go back, but um, that unprompted many of these young people reported concerns about debt, about debt. Uh, and so, you know, they're putting off financial obligations. Uh, and again, when we think about the long-term repercussions of this, it's not just a situation where once the economy comes back, once things reopen, everything's going to be hunky-dory, you know, because of the accumulation of debt, the reverberations of this uh, are going to be long lasting. And so we did ask youth whether they had accessed any of the available direct cash assistance. 63% uh, did get a stimulus payment, 24% reported receiving unemployment benefits. So uh, there are some resources that are being utilized. I'm going to talk a little bit later about uh, some additional resources that we, you know, can be brought to bear, uh, but I'll save that for the recommendations portion. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Simone. Thanks, Debbie. Um, good morning, everyone. We're going to talk a little bit about mental health now. Um, you know, this has been certainly a rough year for, for everyone. Um, and I don't think this is, this is surprising to people, but nonetheless, um, it is very real. Uh, the impact of the pandemic on the mental health of youth really has been, you know, it is pervasive. And um, I'll share just on these next slides a little bit of the, a few of the data points. We're really seeing youth be uh, very affected by being isolated, feeling lonely, and really just, um, you know, not feeling, uh, just feeling very depressed and down. And so when we look at the data, um, youth reported high levels, like I said, high levels of loneliness and isolation. Um, and we, you know, we have to remember, I think, you know, just in context that, uh, you know, many transition age youth are in contact with family. They're relying on the support of their family right now. And this is also a very, you know, social time. When you are in your late teens or your early 20s, you tend to socialize with friends a lot. And so this is, um, something that is supposed to be, you know, that's the natural stage of life. And it's really been, um, you know, uh, there's been something that's intervened on that, that kind of natural stage of life. And so it really has impacted young people um, strongly in the, the area of mental health. More than one in four youth that were surveyed reported feeling down, depressed, or hopeless nearly every day since the start of the pandemic um, one year ago. And then another quarter reported experiencing those feelings more than half the days. And I think, you know, really the most significant finding here is, you know, really probably comparing these figures to, to the figures from the field study for, you know, from one year ago at the, at the start of the pandemic, um, you know, taking together those two data points I shared, you know, a total of 50% of the youth surveyed um, this year were feeling down or depressed for at least more than half the days since the start of the pandemic. And the survey conducted a year ago, that figure was at 24%. So it's, it's more than doubled. Um, so this is, I think, really where we see, um, you know, as Amy kind of outlined, the cumulative impact of the pandemic on, on youth mental health. Um, so on this slide, uh, the survey asked whether youth agreed with certain statements and 80% somewhat or strongly agreed that COVID-19 has had a major impact on their mental health and wellness. And then half strongly agreed, only 8% didn't agree with this, with this statement. Um, in looking at the survey results in their entirety, this was the strongest impact of all. So youth's level of agreement with the statement about COVID having a major impact on their mental health and wellness was greater than their level of agreement when asked about 
other impacts of the pandemic, including housing, employment, education, food access. So really we can't kind of underscore enough um, how this has affected the way that you feel and, you know, and their, their kind of the status of their mental health. Um, and the quote I'd say on this slide is pretty descriptive. I, you know, I didn't shower, I didn't eat, I didn't talk to my boyfriend, I didn't talk to my grandparents, I didn't do schoolwork, I didn't do anything. I just stayed in bed and I slept and I just cried. I mean, um, it's, you know, Ryan uh, will later share some profiles of the, um, some more information about some of the youth that were surveyed that, and that were interviewed. Um, but this is, you know, uh, these are young people that have really gone into depression in many cases during the last year and are really feeling um, extremely isolated and lonely. So we're going to shift now from talking about mental health to talking about the impact on parenting youth. Amy kind of scratched the surface earlier, you know, mentioned that, that uh, in the area of, um, I think, food security, she mentioned, you know, that that parenting youth experienced, um, you know, a greater impact. And what we found that there were there were several areas where young parents are facing greater challenges than non-parents um, during the pandemic. If I can get the slide to change, there we go. Um, so, sorry, I'm having some mouth trouble here. There we go. Um, so I'm sure as everyone can imagine, you know, experiencing challenges with, with income, with mental health, with education, housing, you know, any of these things in itself is really tough. Um, the pandemic has been, a, been a, a difficult time, but really doing it with one or more uh, young children in your care is, uh, is a lot harder and it's scary. Um, it's, it's really tough. And so when we look at Kind of who was you know who we surveyed you know one in five or 119 youth of, that we surveyed were young parents. Um, on average, they were 21 and a half years old. And overall, they, like I said, they appear to be more deeply impacted by the pandemic than non-parents. Um, and on the next slide, I'll share kind of some some of the data points. Um, on this slide, the graph here shows really where where the survey respondents who were parenting were living when they were surveyed. So the most commonly reported setting was their own apartment or house, and that was 28% you know, of them. And then 20%, so one in five, were living in um, THP NMD, the Transitional Housing Placement for Non-Minor Dependents. Um, as Amy mentioned earlier, that um, many, many of the young people we surveyed were, were uh, residing in one, in one of those programs. And then 8% were homeless, and 7% were couch surfing. So we're looking at 15% of youth being, you know, unstably housed or homeless. Um, and that, and again, this is specific to parenting youth. Um, so it's the parenting youth and their children that are experiencing that, that housing, that are in that housing setting or experiencing that um, homelessness or housing instability. Now, when we look at, you know, let's, let's think about this, you know, most young parents, you know, we see here, they, they have one child, 70% um, have one child, um, they maybe haven't, you know, uh, lived long enough to have multiple ch children in many cases, but uh, nonetheless, you know, three in 10 of the parenting youth survey did have more than one child. Um, so we're talking about young parents um, who are, you know, have two children or three children. You can see a very small percentage there, 1%, four children. Um, so these are families, you know, that are uh, experiencing housing instability and that are experiencing these, these outcomes of the pandemic together. So when you look at all of these areas, um, homelessness, employment, and food access, uh, parenting youth were doing worse than youth who were not custodial parents. And these are all, I should mention, these are all statistically significant findings. Um, first, I, I particularly want to just draw your attention to, to the homelessness data point there, the first one. 27% um, of parenting youth reported experiencing an episode of homelessness since, since the start of the pandemic. So that's not just any time in their life. They experienced it at some point. This is over the last year, 27% of parenting youth and their children um, experienced an episode of homelessness. And that's compared to 21% of non-parenting youth. When we broaden that to include housing instability and we look at the number that reported experiencing that at the time of this survey this year, so just very recently, 
the figure is 31% for parenting youth and 19% for non-parenting youth. So nearly one in three parenting youth and their children are experiencing homelessness or housing instability, um, you know, in the very recent, um, you know, very recently, possibly now. Um, and as you can see, parenting youth were, were less likely to be employed also. Um, so 40% of parenting youth were employed compared to 54% of non-parenting youth. And, you know, we have to think about the challenges of childcare. Um, you know, the, I think all parents, most parents were challenged with uh, child care changes or lack thereof, um, you know, over the last year. But again, for a new parent with, with limited resources, it is really, really difficult to, um, even if you weren't laid off, to continue working um, when you are, when you have children in your care. And also, you know, very concerning, parenting youth were more likely to report having very limited access to food or not having access to food and being in crisis. 24% <clears throat> of parenting youth had limited access compared to 17% of non-parenting youth. And so, you know, these findings really, I think they provide a window into the parenting experience and give you an idea of, of the challenges that, that these young families are facing. Um, I'd say the, uh, at the end, I think, you know, Ryan is gonna, I mentioned he's gonna, um, going to uh, mention, um, share some information about some of the young people that uh, were included in the survey and that were interviewed. Um, and it really does outline the experience. And you'll see, um, you know, one of them, um, the parenting experience, the quote there. Um, so now we're going to shift and talk a little bit about race and ethnicity. So we looked at the survey responses and we compared them by race and ethnicity. And what stood out was really the impact on youth who identified as black. So we often talk about the foster care experience, you know, and compare it to the non-foster care experience. But as we all know, you know, it isn't just one or the other, you know, there are individual experiences. And the truth is, you know, foster care is not experienced equally by all children and youth. And certainly the impact of the pandemic is not felt equally across, you know, different racial and ethnic groups. Um, so, we found that black youth have been deeply impacted by the pandemic, um, particularly in the area of housing. There we go. Um, so more than one in three black youth experienced homelessness since February, 2020, and that's compared to one in five non-black youth. So 35% compared to 20%. And you know, these findings are not, um, an anomaly. These are, these are consistent with, with other surveys of youth homelessness kind of outside of the pandemic. Um, you know, the 2017, for example, the 2017 Voices of Youth survey um, found that Black youth were 83% more likely to experience homelessness. Um, so, so again, these are not just specific to the pandemic. This is something, this is certainly a trend. Um, and when you look at the percentage of youth who reported being currently homeless or couch surfing, the figure was 16% for black youth and 5% for non-black youth. So now we're gonna move into the recommendations section um, of the presentation. And I'm just gonna cover the first slide here, which focuses on housing. Um, so, you know, Amy discussed housing earlier in the presentation. Um, and, you know, we also talked about it kind of when we, when we talked about race and ethnicity and parenting youth, and you can see that the housing needs are great. Um, you know, we live in California. Um, we live in a state where housing is unaffordable and unattainable for, for many people. And we have high rates of homelessness, um, particularly among youth who've been in foster care. And so, you know, we, and we saw, we saw in the survey that more than one in five youth surveyed have, have experienced one, at least one episode of homelessness during the pandemic, more than one in four parenting youth, and more than one in three youth who identify as Black. So, you know, this is something we have to address. Um, youth who've been in foster care often don't have the option of living with their parents, but we know that, you know, over half of the young adults in the US age 18 to 29 do live with their parents. And so we, we need to make sure that the public sector helps fill, fill in this void and provide safe, affordable housing. And I will say, you know, to date there's been great investments and great policies um, in our state to, to establish access to supportive housing. And we need to, you know, continue to move in that direction. 
Um, right now, as we speak, there are proposals under consideration by the California State Legislature. Um, we, we can't talk about them in, at length right now, just for the sake of time, but each of the bullets kind of sums up um, the goals of the proposals that at least, you know, we're working on here at JBay, And we're happy to provide more information to anyone who, who would like it. Um, but we recommend that the state sustain investment in California's transitional housing program. We recommend that um, we increase investment in the state's housing navigators program, that we dedicate state homelessness funds to unaccompanied homeless youth, um, or what we sometimes call a youth set aside in, you know, in funding for homelessness, ensuring some of that funding is going to, to address youth homelessness. And then lastly, that we increase investment in transitional housing in counties with high cost of housing, because we know that housing costs vary greatly across the state. And these, some of these counties that have really, the cost of housing has skyrocketed. And so we do need targeted approaches um, to what's going on in those counties. So now I am going to turn it over um, and uh, we're gonna continue to walk through the recommendations. Hi, thanks, Simone. I'm gonna talk about a couple of the uh, recommendations related to education. So first is we need to invest in youth to get them back on track educationally. We know that there are some proven methods to help support these young people stay connected to college. And so our second recommendation is investing in those opportunities. So first our foster youth support programs uh, often known as Guardian Scholars. There's also the Next Up program. They go by different names. These exist across all three systems. The state needs to continue and expand its investment in these types of programs. We're really fortunate to have a great champion in the legislature, Senator Connie Leva, who's sponsoring a bill this year, SB 228, to help expand access to the Next Up program, one of these types of programs, and that needs to continue. Also, I talked earlier about basic need centers and the impact, the positive impact that these have had on college retention. Uh, we need to ensure that there's a basic need center on every campus and that there's st uh, state funding made available to do this. Again, I'm happy to say that there's a great champion in the legislature, Assemblymember Berman, uh, who's working on trying to move this recommendation forward. Uh, the next slide. So I talked earlier about uh, the debt that youth are accumulating, the loss of employment, uh, and we need to provide economic assistance to youth. We need to provide them with stimulus payments to enable them to pay off their debt, maintain their housing, stay enrolled in school, et cetera. Um, the federal government provided California with funding actually to do just that. There's $47 million in funding that has come to the state of California that can be provided to current former foster youth as direct cash payments. Uh, and our recommendation is that that money be issued immediately to current and former foster youth so that we can help them start to uh, dig their way out of that debt, maintain their housing, stay enrolled in school, address their mental health issues, provide for their children, uh, all those things that direct uh, stimulus payments will help them to do. So those are our education and economic assistance recommendations, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Amy. Thank you, Debbie. Our next recommendation is to integrate supportive services into all aspects of serving youth who've been in foster care or homeless. Um, and as you can see, the young people have been very deeply impacted by the pandemic, um, as have the general population of youth and young adults. And just like that group, um, young people currently and formerly in foster care need uh, support, assistance, and guidance. Uh, they need the direct financial assistance Debbie's mentioning, but also um, you know, caring adults who can, who can guide them and assist them. And as Simone mentioned, most young people are receiving this from an extended family member, but that's often less available for young people in foster care. And so we strongly recommend interventions that, that uh, have a heavy, intensive component of supportive services. And this includes the policy recommendations uh, that Debbie and Simone discussed, transitional housing, housing navigation, campus support programs, basic needs uh, centers. Approaches such as these really provide hands-on assistance uh, you know, during this very critical time. 
Next slide, please. Our final recommendation relates to uh, the needs of parenting youth. First, to provide direct, immediate financial support to parenting youth. Um, as you can see across multiple measures, uh, parenting young people are struggling. Um, they can be addressed in the short term with immediate cash relief, which Debbie explained. The federal government has that money is here in California. Um, you know, this, the federal regulations that kind of directed have been issued. Um, it's, it's go time. That money can be pushed out um, very quickly. Um, so that's step one. And then step two is this really lays bare the lack of support for young parents in foster care that was absent before the pandemic. Um, you know, we, we should have done more for them before. We see we, we must do more for them now. And so two approaches that we are strongly recommending is the early infant supplement, which would start the infant supplement uh, prior to the birth of the child to ensure the young person has the opportunity to be well prepared uh, for their child. And then secondly, evidence-based home visitation services, such as nurse family partnership. This is an approach that has been brought to CalWORKS, been brought to a lot of different other programs, and we, we need to bring it to uh, child welfare to uh, support uh, young parents in foster care. I'd like to now turn it over to Ryan. Ryan's a graduate of the University of Oregon and an intern at JBay. Uh, Ryan assisted in the survey design, dissemination, and conducted interviews uh, with you. Uh, thank you, Ryan, very much for being here. Thank you, Amy. Um, for our next section, we have youth profiles. And for our youth profiles, we asked everyone who completed the survey if they were interested in being interviewed. I stayed in and Zoom interviewed these individuals to gain insight on what it was like to be a youth during the pandemic. These are their stories. For our first youth profile, we wanted to focus on the difficulties and struggles that youth have had with their education during the pandemic. Like Debbie had mentioned, 100% of youth had had, that, had had an impact, had, sorry, like Debbie had mentioned, 100% of youth enrolled in school had reported that they had had at least one negative impact on their education. Jamie M is a 20 year old first year college student who, has lived, who lives in San Bernardino County. She's studying culinary arts and business management, but has struggled to do well in school since switching to online classes. From her first couple quotes, you can see online school, like most, is a struggle. There is little to no communication with instructors and student services. Jamie is no different and is struggling to get the grades that she strives for. Every student learns differently, and being outside the classroom means there are less opportunities to socialize and work together, together to complete assignments. Before the pandemic, Jamie just had to focus on school, but due to the pandemic, she had to get a job and was willing to sacrifice her health to maintain it. Next slide, please. For our second youth profile, we wanted to learn more about what it was like to be a young parent during the pandemic. Simone mentioned earlier that young parents face multiple challenges and are more likely to experience homelessness, be unemployed, and have limited access to food. Natalia M. is an 18-year-old high school senior from Napa County who had a daughter right before the pandemic started. She has struggled to find a job and has failed some of her classes. Not all young parents have a support system to help them take care of a new child. Like Simone mentioned earlier, the average age of a young parent is 21 and a half years old. I'm 24 and I feel like I am nowhere near ready to take care of a baby. Being a parent takes and requires a lot of responsibility. For Natalia, the pandemic wouldn't allow her to work to help support herself. Without a job and inability to attend online classes, Natalia struggled to stay in school, but is trying. She has aspirations to be a veterinary tech, but knows that she needs stability now before she can get, she can get into that. Natalia worries about her future. She has a daughter to think about now, but she's trying and she's learning. When I talked to her, she wanted adults to know to be patient with her. She feels that like youth are expected to learn things, but also already know them. Next slide, please. Our last youth profile is focused on employment or lack of em employment. We wanted to get a better understanding of how difficult it is to obtain and maintain a job. Like we mentioned earlier, two thirds of youth reported that the pandemic had a direct impact on their employment. 
Serena H. is a 20-year-old college student who is double majoring in biology and anthropology. At the time that I interviewed her, she was about to graduate with three associate's degrees. So congrats, Serena, because I only have one degree. <laughs> she lives with her grandparents in Sonoma County and has been struggling financially since the start of the pandemic. Serena started off 2020 on the right foot. She had a job and she just got a new car. Things were really looking up for her. Then the pandemic hit. She lost her job at Panda Express. And when she got a different job as a medical receptionist, she didn't feel comfortable working there if it meant, not, if it meant risking not only her health, but her grandparents' health. I want to point out this quote that she had. All of a sudden, I lost my job and I had to ask, pick your car payment or eat. Pick your car payment or pick your school book. Pick your car payment or pick that uniform for class. Pick your car payment or a new laptop. Serena had to make sacrifices. She had to prioritize what she needed and if that meant eating less, she would do that. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ryan. Um, Ryan did a great job uh, together with uh, Alexis Berries conducting um, interviews that really, really brought a lot of interesting themes forward and allowed us to kind of, you know, get more information um, and, and just have great conversations with young people about uh, their experience during this long, very difficult year. Um, so we have a few minutes before we wrap up, um, and I'd like to kind of ask people, you know, if you have a question or a comment, if any of this resonated, you'd like to say I agree or I disagree, we're happy to share that. Um, we do believe that while this last hour we've reported a lot of unfortunate things, we know that we can, working together, um, you know, address these address these challenges and that really is the intention of the survey um, now we know what their experience is and and what are we going to do uh, to try and address them um, the first question i'd like to go to i'm going to direct to debbie um, this is a question i think about the inner relationship between housing and and schools and uh, we're going to ask you what are your recommendations for providers who would like to expand and create student housing beds but are meeting resistance from academic institutions with regard to how much they can be involved to support the process due to liability. Um, is that anything that you want, would like to comment on or do you have any thoughts about that? And I, maybe they mean sharing educational information is what they're talking about in terms of liability. Any thoughts, Debbie? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, Honestly, I would suggest that you reach out directly to us or to me, and I'd be happy to have a conversation with you because there's so much variation by campus. And I, I think maybe what you mean by um, liability is, well, you know, I'm not sure if you're talking about liability around sharing information or actual liability around building housing and the kind of insurance needed and all of that. But there are definitely campuses who have done this and who have partnered with um, local providers to do this. So my experience is that campuses become much more comfortable with something when they see that somebody else has already done it. And so I'd be happy to have a conversation with you to better understand what you're looking to do and so that we can figure out, you know, who else has already done this first, which could pave the way for you to do it in your local community. Thanks, Debbie. Um, I think an excellent comment is the importance of family support. Uh, says family support seemed to be a key protective factor. Should another recommendation address the importance of supporting this early on? Um, absolutely. You know, essentially, we've seen from the pandemic that that families are the safety net. You know, um, and when that's not in place, um, you know, there are implications. So I think that's an excellent point. Um, another you know, question, I'll, I'll direct this to you, Simone, is uh, thank you for the webinar. Do you have any recommendations for other studies to look for for outcomes for young people in foster care during the pandemic? Anything um, that you'd like, you know, explored more deeply? Simone. Um, I think that, I mean, there's obviously the, the study that we've referred to um, in in this presentation that was conducted a year ago on using the pandemic um, during the pandemic a year ago, um, 
and and you know we compared it uh, throughout the the presentation. But I think the um, you know there's been uh, certainly studies of the various you know areas we've touched on um, housing and food security and education and employment um, it hasn't necessarily been specific specific to the, the pandemic, but there's certainly many um, studies uh, on youth and their, their experience of these things. I mean, the first one that comes to mind is the Cal Youth Study, um, when you're looking at youth in extended foster care. I mean, that would be um, the, the number one study to look to for youth in extended foster care, but it's not going to obviously focus specifically on the pandemic. Um, there is uh, I, Foster Nation, um, one of our colleagues here at JBA just pinged us, um, Foster Nation did a survey of foster youth impacted by the pandemic as well, she says, or Foster Club, sorry, not Foster Nation, Foster Club. Um, so that would be something to look to. Um, but I don't know of any others that are happening, you know, right now. Um, I don't know if, if Debbie, um, if you know of anything, I don't personally. Well, this is Amy. One thing I'd like to raise is we have uh, talked to the field center. You know, personally, I would like to see a two-year period of study. Um, I think just like other major disasters, natural or otherwise, the effects of the pandemic are longer uh, for certain people than other people. Um, and so we have talked to the field center about a two-year a project potentially where they would issue a number of policy briefs and kind of continue to explore various impacts. Um, because if we don't know what the effect of the long-term effect of this is, we can't, you know, you know, advocate or craft or whatever role we play, um, uh, you know, you know, interventions that address it. Um, and so um, we definitely, you know, we know people never returned to Louisiana after Katrina. We know people were permanently displaced. Um, so what is, you know, you know, and that is tragic. Uh, and that was a long time ago. Um, so we don't want it to be in a, you know, this pandemic to have long-term effects like that for young people. And we don't need to um, if, we, if we really work together in a concerted way. Um, so there, one last question was about the focus population, demographics, age, location, other. We do have all that um, in the report. Uh, the report is on our website. We'll also be sending it out to all registrants um, at the um, end of the uh, web seminar along with the recording. So thank you everyone who participated today. I can't believe we got through it in an hour. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Uh, we appreciate all of your uh, commitment to young people, and we look forward to working with you um, to address many of the issues identified in the report. Have a good day. Bye.